the NIM experiments, uh, uh, Laura Ann Petito, who I quoted, was in fact the researcher who, if those of you don't know it, it's a, it was an attempt by some very good cognitive scientists and linguists to raise a chimpanzee from birth in circumstances as close as they could mimic to the way a human child would be raised. And Laura Ann Petito, who's a fine scientist, was the person who was actually the, was with Nim all the time and ran the experiments. And what I quoted, you heard, that no matter how much they tried, Nim could get nowhere. I mean, for a while, they kind of fooled themselves. There's an interesting book called Nim uh, that they wrote about it. And if you read the book, uh, the first chapters describe the great achievements of Nim. You know, next he's going to give a lecture at the Vienna Academy and so on. But uh, at the end, when they finish the experiment, the experiment, uh, a chimp gets pretty aggressive after a while, and after a couple of years, they couldn't keep him any longer. Uh, one of the graduate students who was doing a doctoral dissertation on it uh, look, worked through the frame-by-frame uh, -frame protocols. They were very careful in collecting evidence, and he went through all the protocols, and it turned out that they had been completely deluding themselves in ways that are clever Hans-style ways. The experimenters who were very skilled and practiced either were sig subtly signaling NIM in ways that NIM picked up and responded, or else they were taking st strings of meaningless symbols and picking things out which seemed to make sense. Like NIM would do a lot of signing and they see one sign that they interpret as give and another sign that they interpret as banana. And they say, oh, Nim's asking for a banana. Actually, what's going on in Nim's head, nobody knows. But it was nothing like this. And in fact, it was a total failure. And every other experiment with animals has been the same, which is not at all surprising. Uh, apes are uh, 12 million years of evolutionary distance from us. And it appears, as I mentioned, that this, these distinctive human capacities are very recent even in the human line, probably about 100,000 years, which is nothing. You know, that's yesterday. Uh, furthermore, we have very strong evidence that shortly after these capacities emerged, they didn't change anymore. So it's almost certain that for the last maybe 50 to 80,000 years, there has been no detectable evolution among in human cognitive capacities. We know this because if you take, say, an infant from an Amazon tribe that is, hasn't had human, other human contact for 20,000 years or something, and the infant is brought up in Prague, it'll be indistinguishable from children brought up here and conversely. There are essentially no detectable differences except extremely marginal. Uh, in uh, cognitive capacities. So what it looks like is that something happened very suddenly and didn't change. And what happened? Well, whatever happened created the huge gulf between humans and every other organism known. And there's some suggestions about what it might be. Uh, I strongly suspect that what developed is the uh, com computational mechanism for generating the basic properties of language, which apparently emerged at that time, uh, infinite unbounded structures with interpreta complex interpretations, uh, which seems to be totally lacking among all animals. Now, when you get to sign, a, a lot has been learned about sign in the last 30 years or so. Actually, look, Petito, one, who I mentioned, is one of the leading researchers in this. And what's been discovered has been pretty surprising to a lot of people. It turns out that sign is essentially identical to spoken language. And of course, it uses a different modality. And the different modality induces some differences. Like uh, words have to come out in sequence, because that's the nature of our articulatory organs. Uh, but uh, sign it can use simultaneity 
So the express, you know, lifting the eyebrows through an expression, through a series of signs, can turn it into a question. Let's say, and other, and the reference in sign systems is different because you can create a visual space and identify points in it, and you know, refer back to them. So there are differences like that. But in terms of the internal nature of the system, it looks identical. Uh, there's even rather surprising results that show that from the Salk Institute that show that it's neurally represented in the same areas, which was a surprise because it was thought that it might be right hemisphere uh, localized since it's visual, but it's not. It's left hemisphere vocalized in the same parts of the brain, which means there's some analytic system in there which is working modality independent. And furthermore, this has since been extended. Now, there are studies of people who have lost both sight and vision, so they don't use sign or sound. And they learn, they can learn and gain a remarkable fluency in language uh, just by touch. It's astonishing when you look at it, the way th these people are taught language is by putting their hands on someone's face with thumb is on the vocal cord, so you can see if it's moving. The fingers determine facial motions. And from that amazingly impoverished evidence, they can develop something like full fluency. One of the most famous case is Helen Keller, who was extremely fluent. She lost uh, sight and vision about 20 months old, and she actually invented this system for herself and can complete fluency. Uh, the, in fact, the order, even the order of acquisition is remarkably similar. Uh, so those of you who've had children or dealings with children will be aware that uh, there's typically around 15 months of age, roughly there, uh, children interchange the first and second person pronouns. So they refer to themselves as you, and they refer to their mother as I which is understandable because the mother says I and refers to the kid as you, so the kids think those are names. And then they get over it after a while. Well, it turns out signing children do exactly the same thing at the same age, and in that case, it's counter-iconic. They use the same, if they're, used this, you know, they're using this gesture, say this gesture, if they're using it to point to him, it's him. If they're using it in a linguistic context, it's me. So it's counter-iconic, but it goes through the same transition. And in fact, just about everything that's looked at suggests that uh, language is basically uh, independent of sensory modality. Any, we can't use smell because it's not differentiated enough, but anything that's sufficiently differentiated, you could use to externalize whatever's going on in there. And there really are no known beyond the kind of things I mentioned, there don't seem to be uh, basic differences between sign or even touch and uh, spoken language. So it looks like as though that what emerged suddenly, maybe 75,000 years ago, is some computational mechanism that provided the basis for creative use of language and thought. And if you look at the archeological record, it pretty much corresponds to that uh, around that time, roughly, say 75,000 years, you know, plus or minus tens of thousands, which doesn't mean much. There is an outburst of uh, creative invention, uh, much more complex tools, uh, complex family structures, which you see in the archeological record, uh, a marking of astronomical events, uh, beginnings of symbolic art, uh, some anthropologists call it the great leap forward, sudden change, which are usually, uh, it's usually guessed this is connected to the emergence of language, hard to imagine what could be. And after that, it just never changed. And it does seem to be sensory, uh, independent of sensory modality. So very likely that's the source of human creativity. Well, how could it have happened? I mean, that may be one of those mysteries that are, in principle, you can imagine evidence, like you could have tape recorders from 75,000 years ago, but we don't have them. 
uh, the kind of evidence that's available may not suffice to provide answers to the question of what happened. In fact, if there are going to be answers, I suspect they'll come from the brain sciences. Uh, this, the, the, the brain sciences are way short of reaching this point, but someday they might get to the point where you could identify the kinds of neural configurations that entered into some slight rewiring of the brain that yielded these infinite capacities. That's about the best hope, I think. Thank you.